Again, a pleasure to welcome you back from the lunch, um, and deep apologies for the slight delay in the arrival of the lunch. Um, and now we're going to move on to the uh, second session where we giving uh, our DSP, the doctoral uh, uh, scholars, opportunity to just present uh, where they are with the formulation of their uh, research. Uh, so we'll start with Callum. Uh, and I think it's about 10, 12 minutes each. Yeah. And we'll take questions, comments, suggestions after each of the presentations. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Callum Nolan. I'm part of the Human Geography Department here at Reading, supervised by Chuts and Uma in economics. I'm going to be talking about my presentation, uh, Multinational Oil Companies and Climate Justice in Nigeria. So <coughs> I've got one key re research question at the moment, which is what is a just contribution of multinational oil companies <coughs> to the cost of climate change in Nigeria? I'm hoping you know, to achieve from this, it might not be massively apparent at the moment, but I'm hoping to achieve a kind of bridge between kind of philosophical theories of climate justice and more kind of practical application at, at the other end. So I, I hopefully that kind of comes out throughout the slides. Um, kind of a recurring theme of my work will be uh, based on CSR, it's what I've done as, as a, at master's level. Uh, there's quite a lot of ambiguity around CSR and it, it kind of there's, there's yet to be a real solid definition of it, but I think this is quite an appropriate one. Uh, it says that uh, both of the Friday said that there's three things that CSI incorporates a variety of theories and practices that recognise the following uh, that companies have a responsibility for their impact on society and the environment that goes beyond potential uh, legal comp uh, compliance. It says that companies have a responsibility for the behaviour of those with whom they do business, so for example, you know, within the supply chain, and also that business needs to manage its relationship with wider society, be that through uh, for commercial reasons or to add value to society. Um, so I've got, I, I kind of got a, a rough, very kind of rudimentary three-stage plan of how I'd like to, to approach the research. Um, so firstly, I'd like to develop a proposal of what a just contribution of oil companies to climate change in Nigeria is. I'll derive this through kind of the, 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 the overarching existing uh, philosophical arguments towards it and concepts of justice. Firstly, I'm going to look at corporate moral agency. I think to consider responsibility of all companies, you need to you know, prove that they do have, in fact, have kind of moral agencies and can make moral decisions. Uh, so I guess I'll look through the various, uh, the various ways that you can decide whether someone is and, and apply that to the oil companies and see if they come out the other side. Secondly, I'd like to look at Pluto Praise Principle. I've opted to use this because I think, you know, of, of the existing theories of justice, I've opted to use this because, you know, there's, there's precedent for it being used in industry to hold businesses accountable. Uh, it's, you know, it's a fairly, uh, this is, you know, it's going to sound slightly, but I think that there's a fairly, well, there's certainly a strong argument that it can be applied to the oil companies in, in Nigeria. And again, this is, you know, this is slightly ambitious, but I think there's, you know, there's, it can avoid some of the agency questions normally when you look at fossil fuels because, you know, you, don't necessarily have to look at end users because I think there's there's certainly enough example of environmental degradation on behalf of the oil companies that goes way below what even a very baseline idea of environmental responsibility should look like. Um, I'm also going to look. I've I've what well, you know, I'm going to call it a bolt-on, which is that I think it should extend to. I mean, uh, my idea is that at the moment, Pluto Pays really in climate justice looks at emissions of greenhouse gases. And I'm going to suggest that we should really look at uh, other forms of pollution that enhance you know, and, and worsen climate vulnerability. So what I've really got in mind here is oil spills. I think, it's, I think you know, they damage kind of aggregable land and, and potentially potable water. I think it's important that they're included in this. Uh, and finally, I want to look at corporate social responsibility, more the kind of the normative ideas behind it, uh, particularly with reference to responsibilities in countries with weak institutions. I think there's, you know, there, there, there's a body of literature that suggests, you know, should companies fill the institutional voids in the countries they're working? Obviously, this is this is a bit of a, a, a kind of perplexing question because they're quite often there as a result of, well, you know, they're there to uh, to compromise the, you know, to sorry, they're there to exploit the existing the existing institutional void. So I kind of want to get an idea of what, what theory says they should, they should be doing in these countries. So once I've determined what a just contribution may look like according to theory, 
this will be the crux of my kind of em empirical research. So I want to look at, you know, given now we have this idea of what a, justice, uh, a just contribution will look like, is it feasible, uh, is it appropriate, and what would be the, you know, how can we maybe implement this, what, how can we start moving towards this? Uh, so yeah, to do so, I'll essentially be carrying out primary research, um, with, you know, speaking to, you know, fingers crossed, speaking to uh, affected communities, to civil society, to you know, academia, you know, oil companies, you know, the Nigerian government. Like, you know, I hope to really get a broad idea of you know, how we can apply this. Um, and it's, uh, I was pleased that Sonia mentioned earlier, this, the importance of understanding perceptions of justice. So we can, you know, we can take this idea of justice from theory, but what do the people who are truly affected by it, you know, how, how do they feel that is appropriate and, and where can we move forward from there? So the third stage will then be to set, uh, develop a set of recommendations through CSR how you know, we can move towards this just, you know, how we can move towards a more just, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to be idealistic say, to achieve it, but certainly kind of pragmatic ideas of how we can take steps in the right direction. To approach this, I mean, first I, I think it's, it's very important to develop an idea of the institutional conditions that force oil companies to behave in this way. Um, you know, the, the technology is there to, to stop things like gas flaring and there's, you know, there's certainly been you know, pressure, maybe not enough pressure, but there is pressure there and there is awareness there of it. What are the business decisions that stop them resolving this and what is the, what is the thought process and, and the kind of the corporate argument for not resolving these issues? I, I think it's very important to understand that as well as the various institutions in Nigeria, you know, where are they weak, where should pressure come from, where is it coming from? And then from that, you know, I'd like to develop a set of recommendations essentially. Um, yeah, through CSR of, of how we can start to head it. And that will be a case of you know, taking in theory, taking in the, the empirical research that I've, I've, I've obtained and, and moving forward from there. So that, that I mean, obviously it's, yeah, it's kind of early stages, but that's, that's the, the approach I'd like to take. Um, why I've chosen to do Nigeria, to kind of focus as a, as a case study. Not, yeah, I mean, this isn't kind of hugely surprising around, but uh, it's, it's a country, you know, much like the majority of sub-Saharan Africa that is particularly vulnerable to climate change. Uh, so in the last 50 years, there's been there's kind of there's good record of increased flooding, uh, rainfall, uh, sorry, reduced rainfall, sea level rises of uh, I think between two and five millimeters, uh, temperature increase of just under one degrees, and a particular issue with Nigeria is that so it's, it's most of the coastal area is is, is under two meters above sea level. Um, I think of a I think population is around 180 million. 25% of them live along the coastline of Nigeria, uh, mainly because you've got obviously Lagos, which is a particularly large city, and also, you know, this is also kind of particularly relevant here because the oil industry is based in the very south coast and in the Niger Delta, which I think they suggested that by the end of the turn of the century could be 80% submerged as a region if, you know, as business as usual goes on. Uh, potential emissions. So, obviously, we've kind of we've touched on the population in Nigeria. This is this is set to uh, increase massively by 2050, so as, as much as 30 million people. Uh, emissions are also set to double. This, I, I appreciate that Nigeria is not a huge emitter and hasn't been a huge emitter, but I think with a country that still has so much uh, economic development to go through, and with the you know with the population rising so fast, I think it. I think this would, this would make them the third largest country in the world, you know, if, if things go as they are. So I think it's, it's very important we look at them and, and look at ways that we can, we can kind of curb the, the emissions that come from them. And finally, it's, it's a, again, it's, it, it poses a very difficult question, Nigeria, because it's a country that would, as things stand, would suffer greatly to, uh, to divest from fossil fuels. Um, you know, we can see that 75% you know, of, uh, of government revenue and 95% of export revenue come, you know, and it, as much as there's there's obvious concerns about the distribution of the money that they have already. Uh, I think you know, it'd certainly be dangerous any kind of rapid divestment as, as things stand. With regards to Nigeria's ambitions, so they, they hope to cut 20% by 2030 uh, and 45% conditional on, on international, increased international help. So you know, we can see that you know, the, 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 these are the six key things that they highlighted in the INDC and you kind of and it, seemed, it does seem very ambitious, given the kind of existing problems that they have, given the kind of the, you know, the issues with poverty and, and crime and corruption. It seems like a, you know, a massive task. And uh, you know, the likes being really been spoken about today, this, is, this isn't something really that they should have to prioritise. And, and you know, we've got, I think we have to look at ways that we can, we can help with this. Uh, so sorry, we touched on gas flaring at the end here. 
uh, so if, if anyone does know, essentially it's the, that is, you know, when you take oil from the ground, it can often produce natural gas. At the, I mean, as, as much as there is, a, you know, it is of value at the moment, it's in a vast majority just, just burns off and, and goes, in. obviously the, the uh, environmental repercussions of that are pretty severe. So the oil, company, uh, the oil industry in Nigeria, it's, it's essentially it's run by five large companies in joint venture with the, with the state-run uh, Nigerian National Petroleum Company. The upstream operations, so those uh, essentially split upstream and downstream. Downstream is kind of end-user end use, uh, not so from petrol stations, I imagine, and upstream looks at the, taking it out of the ground, storing it, uh, refining it. There's, it's, yeah, the, 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 again, it's, it's no massive surprise or any of the massive environmental degradation, particularly through gas flaring oil spills, which is why I want to focus on that in my work. And finally, uh, and you can see kind of the massive savings and the massive contribution that gas flaring makes to the country's emissions. They, they think that 64 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent can be saved annually just by eliminating gas flaring. Uh, at the moment, they contribute through two key mechanisms. So the first is you know, corporate social responsibility. So this encompasses pretty much everything they do. So uh, voluntary agreements, uh, cooperations they do. And it, from, you know, from albeit a very early stage, look, most of it focuses on gas flaring and oil spills, which poses the question that is the reduction of a negative that is exclusively from them enough? You know, it, you know, does that even count as responsibility? Or is that just you know, really just bringing yourself back to zero? Um, it's voluntary by nature and it's you know, poorly regulated. And secondly, taxation. Um, so they do, they do pay taxes, obviously, you know, these are legitimate companies, but it brings up questions of what well, I think drags back to the earliest point of what is their responsibility in countries where the institutions are weak. So knowing that the tax isn't being distributed, you know, should they contribute more? I think, I think, you know, I think that's a question that it certainly rises. And finally, how I hope to contribute, um, you know, how the research will contribute, I think yeah, again, it's been touched on. There's, there's a real, I think there's a real lack of work looking at the responsibility in climate change of, of companies. We've obviously seen there's, you know, there's much increased uh, involvement of them, but you know, really to kind of to look at them you know, from a philosophical aspect is, you know, I think is, is important and you know, certainly underdone at the moment. And secondly, yeah, just again, kind of it, it goes back to an early ideas. I think it's it's important to really, really try and grasp an idea of the responsibility of businesses in these countries. Um, the, you know, the, the, the complex relationships between them and the governments, you know, what they should do, should we kind of very much limit it to just you know, philanthropic or should we give them a, a, a real role in, in mitigation moving forward? And that's everything. Thank you very much. Comments? Ideas on how we can improve? Actually. Ali? Um, so, two things I think. Maybe even something that doesn't work. So, but the first thing um, I'm, I'm not sure about. So, I wanted to ask you what you thought about the supply chain in connection to the idea of polluted pays <coughs> from multinationals. So, the thing is, just is it really appropriate to describe the multinational corporation as the polluter in this context? Mm. I mean, who's actually doing the polluting? The end consumer who buys the oil and drives the car, I suppose. And then you might think there's a role to be played if you think about possession in terms of counterfactual dependence. So if not for the end consumer, if not for the middle companies that bought the oil from the bigger companies, if not for the, and then would those companies have extracted oil if it wasn't consumer demand for the product? So one thing is just, how much do you intend to treat responsibility and causation all the way down the line? And have you got a justification for focusing on the multinational corporations? Um, and then the second thing, this is the thing that might be more confused at the moment, but I guess I wondered about the division of responsibility in a way of ending up with Nigeria-specific claims. So the thought is, if there are these five multinationals, they're presumably extracting oil in lots of different countries, and Nigeria is going to be one of those. Mm. And then is the thought that you want to tell a story about any given multinational's kind of obligations in light of the fact that it's done some oil extracting in various countries. And then would the thought be to deduce Nigeria's share of what e.g. Shell owes <laughs> from its broader pool of what it owes to everyone? Or is there some other way you want to think about the causation? For example, it's just it extracted oil in Nigeria and we bracket everything else. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think these are things that I, I, I know I have to confront and <laughs> have kind of opted to 
not so far. These are, you, you can probably guess I'm not kind of from a philosophical background, and these ideas of agency are, 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 are very new to me at the moment. Um, I mean, kind of what I, I, I was kind of implying to earlier is that I think by, I mean, I think there's a, a big argument to be made and there's potential big reparations to be made purely on gas flaring and oil spills alone, um, which, again, I, kind of, I, I mean, I certainly can't ignore them, but there is this element that I can, I can just centralise on these, and I think that like, there's, you know, based on that alone, there's a lot of money to be paid back, and, you know, there's a lot, but, I, 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 and, I, and it's kind of similar on the, on the other, I'm, I'm trying to hold Nigeria in abstracted from everything else at the moment, just because I think maybe doing it on, a, on an individual company basis could be quite useful. And, and Nigeria is obviously kind of typical of a lot of resource-dependent countries, uh, this, this kind of relationship with you know, pollution and, and, and poverty. So I'm hoping by the end of it there'll be things that I can draw from that to a, to a broader perspective. But I, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's a huge amount that I need to kind of confront with, with uh, these ideas of agencies and, and causation and stuff like that. But I'm, Oh, yeah, to talk Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that too. Tara. I'm not going to ask anything hard like that. I wouldn't know what else to give you. Um, I was just going to say, where you said you were looking at corporate social responsibility, and I think that's something that we should be looking at. And I think that's where you said you were looking at corporate social responsibility as being more than just responsibility, say, for the direct pollution cause. Yeah. One thing we did recently in the foundation, um, I think we have it in draft form, if not fully finished, but that might be useful, was looking at um, ESR, environmental, social, and and governance reporting, hmm. ESG, so ESG yeah. reporting, environment, social and governance, and trying to look at, you know, frameworks that exist already, the companies are already doing, mm -hmm. that are looking at responsibility in the broader sense, mm -hmm. so that it's not just for the pollution, but also for social rights, governance, the, yeah. the, bro the broader aspect. So, um, remind me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fergus. Yeah, um, so I think it's great that you're kind of getting your hands dirty with this sort of non-ideal theory question, and there's actually a lot of links to my own PhD project, so we should talk a bit afterwards. But two, I mean, two thoughts. One is kind of what's the um, what's the key moral dilemma here that you? Would, it, I mean, I'm assuming it sort of is primarily a applied political philosophy or non-ideal theory kind of mm. head around its core, but with some engagement with social science, and and so if that's if I'm right in that assumption. What's the core moral dilemma that you're going to be addressing here? What didn't quite come out? There's a few minor ones, but <coughs> so that's one, one question. And then one point is sort of, so, so what I'm looking at is more um, justice in policy transition. And what I, what I was thinking when you were talking, we say, okay, what is, what is an oil company, how should an oil company contribute to mitigation? Well, the standard way of thinking about that is, well, to mitigate climate change, we're going to need various policies, let's say, at least partly includes carbon pricing. Carbon prices will apply to, actually, in some ways, oil and gas is a harder for, for some reason. But let's say, take an easier example, like a fossil, like a coal-fired power station, which clearly is the, the polluter, um, and they have to pay that tax. And then the justice question is: Should that be grandfathered, or should they be compensated for the lost value of their assets? And there are a lot of theories that would say yes. So, so that's sort of almost a prior qu question, or how, how does that fit in with you? Whereas you're sort of saying they should make these additional <coughs> contributions. So would that be, let's say, Nigeria introduced a carbon tax. Would they then have to pay that carbon tax and then do more? Mm. So I guess how does this relate to those kind of set of transitional questions? Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> the first question, it kind of took me back a bit there, I just, it's not something I've really kind of explicitly, but I get, essentially, you know, the way I see it, the real moral thing is, is that it's, you know, this is a nation where, you know, there's, there's a lot of money there, there's, there's a huge amount of money, both made by the oil companies and, and, and in the hands of government, but it's just, <coughs> it just, it doesn't, it just doesn't permeate the country at all, so I guess it's, the, the moral thing is, is, because the, the issues of, Obviously, climate change will affect everyone in the country, and there's there's all this money around them. Yet, it's the, you know people will be directly affected by, you know, the, the, this culture and the, and the pollution that comes from these kind of companies will will affect the poorest people. And I guess it's kind of it's kind of salt in the wound that particularly where the oil has come from in the delta is you know will be one of the most worst affected places from you know sea level rises and things like that. So I guess I don't know. I, I, maybe it's difficult for me to kind of really explicitly say them, but I, mean, I think it's more this kind of inherent injustice that there's, you know, there's these people that are really going to face the wrath of climate change, 
whilst on, you know, this is on top of 40 years, 50, 60 years of massive, massive environmental pollution and kind of quality of life uh, damage. Um, with the second one, I, I guess this is what I kind of want to play around with, you know, these ideas, because I think, you know, if I come away having applied to of Hayes and say, what well, you know, they owe this much money, I, 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 I really haven't touched massively on how I'm going to work, you know, whether it's kind of a, a fiscal thing at the end of it, but I guess the, the pragmatism will come in that I think, well, you know, they're not going to turn around and pay a trillion dollars or, you know, to, to the to local community or, or, you know, to pump into <coughs> mitigation schemes. So where can we maybe kind of offset them? Maybe where can we maybe say, well, you know, you've got to do this, this, and this. You've got to contribute to gas stoves and and, and as I, I again, it's yeah. I, so I, I can't really eloquently put it, but I think I'm, I just want to kind of explore these ideas of if they're not just going to put a lump sum forward, you know, where you can start getting them to contribute to the other five goals of key mitigation goals. Okay. okay. Um, I think a smart idea for you might be to just take the questions and not answer them. Yeah. Um, so that you can get many questions. Oh, yeah. yeah? yeah. Uh, so I'll just let the three hands that I'll ask you a question. Really quick. Yeah. What would happen if you look at adaptation instead of or addition to mitigation? Would it change the moral questions and would it change your analysis? Mm -hmm. Very good point. Simon? Simon? You had your hand? I didn't have my hand. Uh, Chris? Yeah. So, so um, this is just a comment, really. So I think one thing which might be helpful for you in thinking about the kinds of responsibilities which oil companies have is the ways in which they're entangled with or replacing traditional state functions in the areas in which they're operating. So one thing about one way of thinking about their responsibilities would be to say, well, insofar as they're performing functions which, under normal other sets of circumstances, we might expect the state to perform, or they're kind of influencing the extent to which the state can perform particular kinds of functions in particular kinds of areas, that might give them responsibilities that they are working on. So that's just a thought. Thank you. Cheers. Yes? Yes, um, uh, under the, the Electrical Secretariat, uh, there was um, a kind of consortium called Global Compact uh, that came up with uh, a guide for responsible uh, corporate engagement in climate policy. Um, and um, so you had a, a number of organizations doing it. And 50 companies have uh, signed up to that to commit to transparent, consistent, and cl consistent climate lobbying. I just wanted, maybe you could look at that uh, report and maybe some of those big companies um, might have been. I'm sure that they have been approached and interviewed, you know, for this big piece yeah. of research, and and to see how this global context, what it would mean, and how different it is, it, it can be replicated yeah. in the case of Nigeria. Uh, maybe there's just going be some some lessons from as well then. Okay, really great comments, questions that I'm, I'm sure will give you a lot to mm -hmm. chew on. Josh. Yeah. Hello, I'm Josh. I'm a PhD student of Katrina Sad Chucks, and I am looking at principles to assess solar radiation diversion. So, first question what is solar radiation diversion? Solar radiation diversion has a broad range of technologies which are covered in the category of geoengineering, which are concerned with I guess diverted solar radiation before it hits the Earth's surface. So this image is meant to show that there's a variety of different places and which this diversion can occur everywhere from space to basically the ocean surface. I am going to look at the example of stratospheric solar radiation diversion, which often uses a technique of sulfur to perform this. You would put a reflective particle which sulfur is. If a stratosphere, this would reflect some solar radiation. You have less incoming solar radiation or less solar radiation get past the stratosphere and that has a cooling effect. Um, I've got a quote here by Nicola Jones on this technology. Studies have shown that such a strategy would be powerful feasible, fast-acting and cheap, capable in principle of reversing all of the worst case warming over the next century or longer. So you can see it's got some appealing features. It's fast, it's cheap, it again is with warming. These are things which people tend to care about when it comes to climate change. It's a quick solution. 
So it's got some faction in policy debates. However, it does raise a lot of ethical questions. I find that's what my presentation to you is going to be about these ethical questions and how we should hopefully engage with them. So I'm going to start by introducing you to some ethical considerations and then hopefully outline how we can go about meeting them. So at this point of the presentation, I was torn as to whether to give you a big table of lots of different ethical ideas or just highlight some ethical ideas as I go through. Luckily, I've got some good guidance from the staff to say that the table would be confusing, so I'll just highlight the ideas as they come up. So, it's common to hear, in the case of climate change, if we're looking at a risky policy, then a situation of emergency is a point at, risk, a point at which it would be most justifiable to take this risk. So, you choose your emergency, you choose for Arctic ice seeds, or you choose four degrees, seven degrees, one of eight climate change, and then we ask the question, at this point in time, is it permissible to perform solar radiation diversion? And I would just like to highlight some reasons why you might, I might want to pause here. So we've got the immediate effects, the effects here and now. Um, so if you were to start performing it, you will start interfering with the Earth's weather patterns. This box of sulfur stays in the stratosphere for a year or two, and then it ends up coming back down to Earth. And one of the key events which we are concerned with is the Asian monsoon. Sorry, I say we, that science has highlighted is the Asian monsoon. Um, so you've got subsistence communities in India and China who rely on this monsoon for their crops and livelihood. We perform SRD, the monsoon becomes weaker or it disappears entirely and we've got a real issue of there's lots of people who rely on this for food who no longer can access food through this means. So this seems to be a very straightforward, straightforward issue of normative concern. It strikes me that we should care about this. And I don't think that's controversial. Um, and then we look throughout time. So you've got the problem of future generations. So um, the idea is, I guess, that we don't just perform SRD once. Our carbon emissions, we assume, are going to keep increasing or stay the same. So it's likely to keep happening. So we keep rolling the dice. We keep making this risk that if our carbon emissions are higher, Presumably we have to keep doing more of it. And by doing that, we seem to be putting ourselves in a situation where we have to keep, where the future generations would have to keep taking this risk. And this leads to the termination effect. So we can imagine a generation, let's say three generations down the line after SRD has started to be performed, I've had generation questions do we really want to continue doing this? For whatever reason, it might be the concerns for one soon, or yes, whatever reason they desire. However, if they stop doing this, this is where I'm going to try to be a scientist now, I think we say that the Earth would be in a state of disequilibrium. So you suddenly have uh, much more solar radiation coming past the stratosphere. However, there'll be much higher levels of carbon than there before we had all that solar radiation coming through. This leads to a period of rapid, walk, rapid warming as the Earth tries to get back into a state of equilibrium. Um, I apologise for that crude climate science, but it's basically something off the lines of this rapid warming if a generation decides to stop doing it, assuming that the carbon levels have been increasing or actually stay consistent, I think, in the mean time. And finally, <coughs> we have many unknowns. We've never had sulfur uh, coming out of the stratosphere of its scale before. It does happen naturally when volcanoes erupt, but that's normally very small regional. It doesn't happen like this. We just don't know what would go on if we were to do this. So given these considerations, it doesn't seem like emergency is enough to 
legitimise our use of performing it. It definitely moves us into a situation where we might like to, but it seems that we still have considerations which we should take very seriously before we could give it for thumbs up. Um, and I think we can crudely put these into we've got distributive and procedural concerns here which may heavily on our decision making. So again I'll highlight some procedural concerns. So first you've got the idea of the participation of the vulnerable. So it strikes me that we've got at least two distinct groups of vulnerable people here who we value in this process. You've got those who are going to suffer from climate change if it goes off the path we're going on, and you've got those who are going to suffer if you perform SRD. And in some cases, they might be the same people, in other cases, it might be different groups who are affected in different ways, and it strikes me that both of them have legitimate considerations here which need to be taken into account. So we need to work out how we can give them their due in the decision making process. And of course you've got the classic question of future generations here, always a very tricky question, but it seems like they are seriously affected by this and if there are ways of giving consideration to them of deciding institutions in such a way that their, I don't know, needs can be incorporated into the process, then in fact seems like a worthwhile endeavour in this case. And finally, we've got the question of how the research should happen. So this is kind of the ethics of the science. Um, should we just allow the research to go ahead unregulated, or do we want certain restrictions on what type of knowledge we should be trying to find out? I know that one sounds quite strange, but there is a kind of Wolsey's argument here that uncertainty could be quite good for having a fair decision-making procedure before we know which countries are going to benefit in exactly what way, and it turns into just power relations. And we've got the distributive concerns, many of which I've already highlighted. Just one other one to throw out there is the danger of unilateral use. So as we've established, it's quite cheap to perform, you're in a country this has got a climate emergency, they could be tempted to just roll the dice and say, well, if we're in trouble anyway, let's go and see what happens. So we want some way of ensuring the fact that unilateral use doesn't occur. Is this enough to judge if it's morally permissible or acceptable? I don't know. This is what the literature has thrown up. It definitely seems to me that these are important questions that have to be answered if we're ever going to meet the standard which is demanded here, yet there could be stuff that the literature has missed or I have missed in the literature. Um, so my tentative proposal here links to the David Keefe style argument which Dan highlighted, which is, it seems like linking SRD to mitigation would help take this seriously and we minimise the amount of time that we would take this risk. But that's very tentative and yes. Final slide, problems. So, uh, what is a climate emergency? This seems to be quite a subjective thing. And Dale Jameson has a nice quote, one person's climate emergency is another's bad day. And this seems, I think, A, very true and quite problematic. Um, so maybe it's whose emergency? I don't know if this is a question which I'm gonna to have to engage with. Finally, can I respect procedural fairness and remove some outcomes from the table? So can you say that unconstrained SRD should not be allowed or the process has to take the needs of future generations seriously? Um, this is a question that I'm playing with. Luckily, Simon emailed me a helpful article here, um, but it's one I'll be yes, happy to engage with. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, so um, Holly, I'm going to start again with you, mm -hmm. and then I'll take two questions. Uh, Holly and Darrell, and oh no, oh, well, Holly, Darrell, are you you you'll start the next one? Yeah. Uh, 
so I know you said in conversation actually that you weren't going to do the comparative project of different kinds of geoengineering mm. strategies compared to one another. So, um, so, but there's a familiar objection to going for um, CDR strategies as opposed to SRM strategies that I was thinking actually could count as a standalone objection to the to the strategy that you're interested in. And then I just wondered if you would be planning to or interested in talking about that. And that's just the objection that um, no matter how much we do in terms of this particular um, solar radiation management strategy that you're interested in, that won't do anything about ocean acidification. Yeah. And that just being a kind of really big and important reason not to pursue those that whole family of geoengineering strategies, and whether we sell that as being compared to concentrating on power removal or not doing any geoengineering at all, it seems to be a worry worth taking. Mm, no, absolutely. So, um, that was one of the side effects which I was able to mention, but. Um, I would like to think with stuff like ocean acidification that that could be captured by linking um, SRD to mitigation. So I think for acidification it becomes a problem if you've got higher carbon levels or carbon levels that remain as they are, but um, by hopefully linking SRD to what I think I'm calling substantive mitigation, that means in a time in which if we were to perform it, hopefully we'd be able to minimise concerns such as ocean acidification. Um, I hope that answers or mm -hmm. yes. the more important thing is to get the questions. Okay. And you can always <laughs> chew on it with your supervisors. Darrow. So, um, it's about this, the, the way you talk about the David Keith proposal and then the context of the okay. of the study of, of your project. So I, I mean I think the David Keith proposal is the most interesting one and the one that we should take the most seriously. And it's the idea that as, as, as mitigation ambition dials up, then solar radiation management dials down. So there's a, there's a terminal yeah. point to the solar radiation management, right? Um, and it handles, it's meant to handle a lot of sorts of questions like ocean acidification and, and termination point and monsoon rains and, and all of this sort of thing. But, but the thing that's notable about it is it's not a proposal for an emergency situation, right? I mean, it's a proposal for the situation we're in now, right? Prior to an emergency, mm. so it's a it, 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 it's, it's a, it's a means by which to hit a mitigation goal, not a means by which to prevent a, an emergency. Um, so, I, if if that's what you're interested in, if that's the sort of uh, proposal that you also think is the most interesting, then I'm not sure why you're talking about the emergency context okay. in the first part. Of yeah. Oh uh, well, I guess um, it's due to the risks at the moment. So I. At the moment, I think the risks motivate us to start at the point of emergency to form it to be something which we could consider legitimate. And perhaps maybe there are other points prior to an emergency at this point it might also be legitimate. However, I would have to think very carefully about that. I can't I think as a starting point. I think an emergency is a nice point to make sure we don't capture stuff we wouldn't want to capture restricts the domain quite conveniently. Um, yeah, so I guess I've just been more concerned. I think for risks push us to the emergency for it to be legitimate at the moment. But they would keep my disagree. <laughs> Henry, please. Um, I'm glad somebody's doing some work on this. Um, I wish we didn't have to, but uh, uh, I suppose that's not the right sort of thing to say in an academic institution. My, my, my question or issue for you to consider is who's we? Um, you're, you're talking about you know, it might be a good idea for us to do this, or if you or we did, did the other. Who are you talking about exactly? Yeah. And under what, within what framework could the person or persons be working? Uh, and that leads into the question of governments. And governments of climate change and action on climate change is hard enough. But governments of um, geoengineering and experimentation of one sort or another, wow. Um, but, you know, it's already started to a certain extent. Um, so uh, the, there was an early promoter of, uh, of, of sulfur seeding 
uh, who was the deputy chair of IPCC, Yuri Israel. Well, I think he's still around because they never go away, these Russians. Um, <laughs> and, and, and he actually, yeah. he, the worst of Russian, the worst of Russian experiments, um, what you learn from local CD, I'm not quite sure, but I'm sure the Russians did, uh, did that. And I believe there was, there was another one called the Spice Project. I can't remember that, what that stands for. Um, which got quite close, and then they chickened out on the on on. on, 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 on they didn't chicken out; they got shut down. The massive public outcry was in Cambridge, where they wanted to have the long tube that would take stuff and put them in the atmosphere. And they 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 wouldn't. The local sorry, I don't mean to take over here. The, the local the they they got shut down because they couldn't get the ethics permission. Which Cambridge? It was Cambridge. You know, Cambridge, UK, to, to do this because there was such a public concern about the implications of even doing geoengineering research and that the ethics hadn't been worked out, so that project got stymied for the time being. I don't know where it is now. That was as of three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. Thanks. I, I, I don't think I knew that last time. But then there's the question of, of global governments. The question of global governments. And it's, it's not a completely plan to you because there, there's the, the long-range transboundary air pollution uh, convention probably covers this. Um, Montreal Protocol probably has an angle on this as well. And, and you'll find the same sort of thing, sorry, this is probably definitely too far for, for, for you, but just, 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 to, just as a, an analogy, the same thing happens with um, uh, iron fertilization of, of the ocean. There, the consistency of that with aspects of the UN and the sea and so forth is, it's, it's very, very interesting. I speak from a certain amount of personal in, in, um, knowledge of that because um, uh, AITA, the International Energy Trading Association, uh, was slightly reluctantly brought into sort of um, attending meetings at the IMO about, about the governance of, of, um, uh, of, of ocean acidification uh, related activities. Because it looked, to some people anyway, as though, well, it's it's a form of sequestration. If it's a form of sequestration, and we are talking about obligations, as we were at the time of the Kyoto Protocol, which could be offset by various forms of sequestration, hey, this is great. Then we we actually got we actually got a potential business here. And strictly speaking, you could say the same about about um, a, 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 about atmospheric sulfur, though uh, uh, the application of the measurement would be even more exciting. Um, so there's, and the, but, but ocean fertilization went further. There have been five or six experiments, most of which were actually scientific failures, as far as I remember. A plankton didn't um, get, uh, get, get stimulated in quite the way that they, they, they thought. Um, but the way that those experiments sort of interrelated with national and international law, so there's a, there's a fascinating area about what happens when, firstly, the you is somebody who says, darn it, we're going to do it, and let's not wait for anybody, uh, and, and see what happens. Um, and, and then you start sort of thinking, well, what actually is the regime which covers this? Who's going to address them and how? Uh, or what are, the, what are the means by which they could actually persuade people? I mean, local populations are a, 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 a serious issue. We had exactly the same thing with carbon capture and sequestration in, in the Netherlands as well. Um, but but if, if you have time and space, beginning to get a little bit into the sort of, you know, if, 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 if ethics and justice is related a little bit to democratic accountability through various layers going to existing control systems um, within the UN system or, or, or elsewhere, what, what's the interface there? How, what sort of protection is that? How could it be made better? Thank you, Harry. Uh, well, uh, my quick response is, the first question was, who's me? Um, it is a very global kind of concept of, I guess, humanity for present time, which raises governance. So I do have this idea of global governance going, and luckily that's where Chucks is in my project to help me understand global governance. So I uh, suppose this will come in time. <laughs> Maybe we, you need Henry as a third supervisor, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there are any more questions, I will recommend we just collect them, and, okay. and then you don't have to answer them. But we won't really exploit this opportunity to give our students the best guidance going forward. Any more thoughts? OK, that's good. Alex, then, your turn. Um, 
Yes, my name is Alex McLaughlin. I'm a uh, political theory PhD, um, supervised by Katrina and Robert back there. Um, so I'm looking at, at the sort of distributive question thrown up by climate change. And so much has been said over the course of this conference that I thought I just can't help but kind of have some initial thoughts on, on some of the issues thrown up. So the kind of idea of burden sharing um, has been challenged somewhat, or there have been some different uh, thoughts on the relevance of, of that sort of framework going forward. Um, and it's really helped me see the, the significance of Paris um, in how we think about these sorts of issues. Um, so but I just wanted to have kind of raise a few reasons why I still think these questions might uh, be important. Most of them, in fact, came out of um, Aaron's presentation yesterday, mentioned by him, which is one thing is that... Um, so the, the, the question of... So that more so initially the question of fairness in how we distribute these burdens. Um, so it will help us, first of all, um, increase the effectiveness of these national contributions by um, holding different nations to account and if some people increase theirs, then hopefully um, others will follow suit. Um, and if, the second way we, we might think about it is um, it will give us a standard or critique to judge them, these questions about um, fairness. And then thirdly, this is the kind of deeper question that these um, questions about how we should distribute responsibility don't just go away just because the framework um, and the way that we think about them institutionally has. Um, and finally, I'll just follow a, a kind of tradition now and refer to... Fergus's presentation, <laughs> which is even if we do need to think about, um, kind of change the way we think about this, just in terms of benefits, then we're still going to have some distributive questions about how we share out those benefits. Um, so the second thing um, is that it's just really, um, it's been great to speak to different people and have the chance to reflect on kind of the role of ideal and non-ideal theory in this context, which was kind of bugging me before, but it's really become clear that that's a central kind of uh, theme in my project. Um, so yeah, I was already kind of at a crossroads in that I'm really interested in these historical emissions, but I haven't kind of got a, a distinct idea of how to structure my uh, project yet. So um, this has kind of thrown it more open for me, this, this experience. Um, so I thought, so the questions I've thought of, so I'm really interested in perspectives um, on global distributive justice and how they um, bear on the climate change debate. So these, these sorts of debates concern what our obligations are and the extent of our obligations to... Um, people abroad, basically. Um, so, so, so it struck me when I, when I first became interested in the, the climate change context, the reason it kind of, it, it just seems to be a, a unique context which prompts us to think about these sorts of questions that are raised in these sorts of debates about what people have distributive claims to, to each other, what people are entitled to, and it just seems a real um, natural fit, these kind of theories and climate change debate. And obviously you do see them mentioned a lot, but sometimes I feel like they're under the surface somewhat. Um, and just uh, so to kind of give an indication of my orientation, I've been really influenced by Simon's kind of integrationist approach, which the kind of idea is there, which is to say that the kind of burdens and benefits that we think about in climate change and the issues it throws up are just profoundly interconnected with other aspects of global justice and poverty. And that's been kind of coming out of the, um, the kind of conversations forcefully as well. Okay, so I'm eating into my actual presentation time, but these are all qualifications I've added, so I'm going to have to rush them. Um, okay, so the, the first kind of... So I'm going to talk about um, the burdens of climate change. Obviously, we could distinguish between mitigation and adaptation. I'm going to take the shortcut and have a more general discussion um, and not distinguish between the two. But, so I don't want to provide a sort of definition of historical emissions, but um, I think historical emissions are really interesting, especially in why we're concerned about historical emissions. They've had such a huge sway in the debate. Um, but it strikes me that we can think different things about what's exactly wrong with them. So we might think that so the kind of egalitarian view might be that they're wrong, because they put some people, they're a huge determining influence on contemporary disadvantage relative to other people. We might think that they're wrong because of uh, overuse of a resource historically, and some people haven't got their fair share specifically of that resource. We might think that they're wrong in some other way. And it strikes me that how we understand what's going on with historical emissions is going to tell us a lot um, about these kind of theory theoretical aspects I'm interested in, um, and hopefully guide us maybe in our more forward-looking accounts. So the, the two kind of things that are normally taken to characterise historical emissions are one that they took place before knowledge of their negative effects was sufficiently widespread and were carried out um, to put it crudely by individuals who are now dead. So I'm not, I don't want to say that either of these two features are decisive in any way, but these are, as you'll see as I go on, these are the sorts of um, the characteristics that seem to raise and get theorists kind of animated. Uh, okay, so the, the, we all know the principle of common but differentiated responsibility to dwell on. 
Um, but essentially, so I've highlighted just at random some lots of interesting things that get thrown up by this principle. It's clearly open to interpretation. But it's also clear that it has traditionally been interpreted to put a large emphasis on historical omissions. So that's to say our common but differentiated responsibilities have been taken to derive largely from how we've used the atmosphere in the past. So the kind of theoretical starting points, in a sense, are really interesting. So some theorists just say, well, there's a sense that they're just these historical omissions or history is in some way relevant, um, and in any sort of approach that fails to take them up or pay adequate attention to them is just flawed in some way. So it's interesting to consider how much this is driven by kind of strategic or pragmatic concerns about the, the prominence of these sorts of ideas um, in the debate or how, how, how much they're for other reasons. So if there's been so much emphasis on these historical missions, what's the problem? So there seem to be a few problems that we can kind of group together that, that keep cropping up. Um, so the first one is the kind of simple problem of agency. So um, as I mentioned, the, a large portion of these historical missions we're talking about are potentially carried out by individuals um, who are now dead. So um, if we want to impose costs relating to the actions of historical agents, where those agents are now absent, how are we to justify doing so? And what counts as a very relevant relationship to these past actions? So one response might just be, this focus on individuals is kind of clearly misplaced. Um, you can see from the debate, debates in the um, climate and negotiations, and also in how people talk about these sorts of things, that that's just the wrong level of agency. We're really talking about collectives. And that's a really interesting line of argument, and it's certainly um, something I'm very interested in, but we kind of want to ask some questions about that sort of reason. We, we maybe want to say, what are the sort of normative stipulations that we'd want to put on a collective in order that they can generate obligations? Um, and also we might have some just genuine practical problems about whether we really can um, point to states over time that haven't changed through various um, kind of international uh, forces. Okay, so the second problem um, is the problem of ignorance. Um, so this is, the idea here is that some of these emissions just took place before we could have reasonably been expected to know about their effects. So this isn't here, it's not like they just didn't know because they were being lazy, it's that they couldn't possibly have known as a result of the, um, the best case, the best in class scientific knowledge at the time. Um, so this is normally taken as a, a kind of decisive and strong line of argument that if individuals um, or someone doesn't, could not possibly foresee um, a certain set of consequences, that it seems kind of unduly harsh um, to hold them responsible uh, for the outcome. So this, if we want to kind of ascribe responsibility on fault, then this looks like um, a really kind of tricky situation. Um, so even if we accept this, however, so there's debate um, within this kind of category. So we need to kind of have some idea about what counts as sufficiently widespread, um, and judging by that, when exactly this point occurred in history. So yes, yeah, so there, there have been lots of potential solutions. So it's really what I want to draw out here mainly is just the kind of different innovative ways that theorists have tried to respond and incorporate these historical missions. So of course, I mentioned initially agency, um, but this. So that looks like a way um, to solve the agency problem, but um, and Daryl mentions this in his recent book, it doesn't really seem to do anything against um, the, the fault-based or ignorance problem. Um, so the dual standpoint perspective is a really, really fascinating approach, which is basically uh, works on the kind of logic that we're uh, permanently fallible as moral agents, and what we understand is right or wrong um, seems to change over time. So from that, we can derive two perspectives. We can say we can judge um, what an agent is permissible to do from a time relative standpoint. And it looks like from that standpoint, um, historical missions aren't wrong because they're under ignorance. But perhaps if we take a more all things considered time neutral standpoint and look back from here, we can say that maybe there is something wrong about these emissions um, and we need to do something about them except some liability. So that looks like a potential way over the ignorance problem. Um, but it's not clear that it can do much against the kind of problem of agency. So this third principle is a really fascinating one. I've had, thought about this principle a lot and, um, recently, so the idea here is just um, responsibility, we can loosen the kind of causal criteria between um, agent and victim or we can, what's important here is that the benefits of historical emissions are still present and we can kind of capture what's uh, morally important about them that way. So and then another way is um, just to say, well, maybe we can look and hold agents strictly responsible for historical emissions, either in a beneficiary sense or in a causal sense. Um, and instead we have to look at capabilities, we have to look at agents' ability to pay and assign costs on that, on those grounds. But maybe we can still, within that, try and make that history sensitive to some extent. So we could perhaps say that um, there's, we can target agents who hit, whose wealth came about in an unjust way or a climate endangered way and make sorts of distinctions within that. 
Yeah, but I think it's still the really interesting question of what's actually wrong with historical omissions. Um, so there's different accounts of what is actually going on here. So one, one kind of response is just to go straight for a kind of um, an idea of overappropriation of the atmosphere as a commons. Um, these sorts of arguments are controversial, and, we, and they kind of beg the question and really force us to think about what counts um, as a fair share. Um, you have to move on. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, and this, this, so the other we often hear we don't hear it kind of that sort of argument made in explicit terms. Um, these historical omissions are caught up in the language of responsibility and corrective justice, where what seems to be invoked is just a rebalancing. So if we can just hold uh, agents responsible for the cost of their past omissions, um, then that will uh, be sufficient. Um, but there's a kind of problem potentially in that argument as well. So there's a really interesting early observation by Miller, which says that given that the early um, emissions through certain points in time, we can assume wouldn't have done any harm, it doesn't seem we can point to them and say that there's actually anything wrong with them in themselves. Um, if we're troubled by these historical emissions, what that seems to suggest is that we're saying something about future generations should have some sort of opportunity to admit. And M Miller certainly doesn't want to advocate um, this argument. Um, and so... Simon makes the same sort of arguments about the incompleteness of the proof of page principle without some deeper account um, of what our fair share is in some sense or another. So it's just really striking to me that when we approach these historical arguments, um, we seem to kind of be confronted again with this question about what we might um, have by way of a distributive claim to the atmosphere. Um, and the sort of theories that I'm interested in um, have kind of different takes on this. And, and, and my view is that they're, they're going to what we think might be a fair share is going to really have an impact um, on these historical arguments and they're also going to have an impact on how we approach these sorts of questions going forward. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, I haven't got a clear structural idea, um, but I'm kind of very interested in, in these kind of really divisive debates about historical emissions um, and these kind of distributive questions in this context. And I'd kind of welcome any suggestions as to how I might put that into a feasible project. Uh, but anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Alex. I think you are in the right place for great yeah. questions. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, Dario, come to you. So just a, a, a comment, just in listening to you, that I'm not sure what the, the stage setting bit about global egalitarianism has to do really with the, the questions you're asking by the end. So, I mean, what are you thinking about that relationship between the commitment to global egalitarianism and and trying to come up with or trying to analyze historical. Okay, so, so that yeah, so I think there are two things really. So um, one is it depends on what sort of metric we're using. So what this this final question about entitlement to uh, the atmosphere as a resource, if we're a resources egalitarian, that might be just kind of directly important. Um, but the second, the more kind of intuitive reason, the kind of my hunch is that that. Um, that these kind of debates are just pulling intuitive levers. Well, yeah, so this is exactly the problem I had, basically. I was looking into these historical arguments and trying to really get a nailed-on sense that these arguments were leaning on egalitarian intuitions at, at, at a deep level, but it seems really hard. It's just my hunch that what people are really concerned about in this case are contemporary inequalities, and that's why I've been really drawn to historical omissions. That's not to say necessarily that would be the, the kind of best way to tackle it. Um, going forward, but yeah. Yami? Yes, so I've got a question about the scope and um, maybe the timeline that you're looking at it. So if the, if the thesis is on distributing the benefits and burdens of historical emission, I've got a question about just historical when at the moment I think well, there's two issues. Historical, it could be, yes, as far as, you know, 17 in the industrial period, but it could be even historically for the past 25 years when, people, when, when countries, developed countries knew uh, the effects and, yep. and, 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 and the way to see the responsibility would be quite different between those two periods. And even if uh, you, you, you talk about historical emissions, can you really look at the burden and benefits without looking at the economics and the finance? Associated to that, not so for me. Um, give you know, the, the, the perceptions, you know, between both developing developing countries or consequences, and 
and whether so and, and you, you you put a point in just looking at historical but for me it's, it's going to remain a key issue but what is going to increase is the the, the equity element aspect of current and also future emissions at the same time and so I know that yes historical is but the, this tension <coughs> is going to be to look at at some point and complete <coughs> Yeah, no, I, to be honest, I'd, I'd... Up to four questions there, but... Um, okay, I almost wholeheartedly agree with, with what you're saying. Um, so I, I agree with you. What matters, I'm intuitively drawn to the idea that what matters is our kind of how these emissions contribute to our welfare or capabilities going forward, and that these historical emissions don't really have much more relevance in themselves. So um, but I'm more interested in just exploring what's underneath those historical emissions and the kind of ideas that are driving them in order to see what they might tell us in order to, when we think about these kind of forward-looking aspects. So I, I, I'd agree with you. And also, this, you, you're absolutely right, is this, so uh, the historical emissions I was talking about to kind of draw out these ideas are the ones that we can assume are far back in history. So you're absolutely right, after a certain point, these arguments have, have much less bearing on, on um, the current, kind of current obligations. So. Okay, because of lack of time, I'm going to take uh, three questions and yeah, then you, sure. you, you decide whether you really need to answer all yeah, of sure, them. Yeah. So Henry, uh, Holly, and Dominic, please. Um, the rerun of the previous question to a uh, question to your colleague, uh, really. Uh, who are we talking about? Um, uh, there's some fascinating work that's been done recently about um, uh, identifying the amount of historic emission, really since, almost since the dawn of industrialization, which can be attributed to a relatively small number of extremely long-lived companies, um, including Exxon and, and, and Shell. Um, and it, it always seems to me that too, too quickly people um, start construing historical responsibility on the basis of government X versus government Y. Yeah. Whereas if you go far enough back, you encounter a place where, to the government, to the representatives of the governments at the time, it would be completely incomprehensible to assume that they were supposed not only to know what was going on, but to exercise some form of control over actually normal industrial activities by major and successful companies. So that's another, I'm sure the last thing you want is another layer of complexity, but, but in that of working out who actually you're trying to blame? Yeah. E even even outside the question of sort of you know is it is it right to blame these or like those people? It, it's not it's not as if there is you know the king of X and the king of Y who can be sort of the the, 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 the simple models who you regard as being either guilty or innocent. It's um, mm. it, it's it's lots of players. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll follow that up after. Yeah. Uh, yes, Holly and, and Dominic, try and keep the questions short, please. Um, okay. Two small comments. So one is just that it might be worth starting to think a little bit about the relative weight of obligations from different sources, so from contributing, from being a beneficiary, um, and so on, and then how you think they intersect with, I guess, thresholds on how demanding obligations can be. Because it seems like um, you're going to end up with some sort of hybrid approach, just given that what you say about culpability and so on might, you know, limit emissions at a certain point, like say 1990, and then there's going to be, you know, not enough um, uh, to go around. So you're going to end up with some sort of some sort of hybrid approach. And the other thing um, was just to say in terms of novelty for the project, and other people <coughs> like Dominic and Simon can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that the dual standpoint thing seemed really interesting um, as a way of pursuing something in this debate, because lots of the other things you've talked about, I guess, are fairly familiar yeah. in a pretty big literature, whereas that struck me, at least, as being kind of ex uh, fairly exciting and new, so that might be a nice thing to focus on. In I think it gets really deep and, like, yeah, scary. I think those <laughs> sorts of questions about how morality goes over time, but certainly interesting, anyway, yeah. yeah. Dominic. <coughs> Just a small remark on, you know, when, when did we know... <coughs> And the biggest strange thing is that many people ask this question, what's the time point? And the evidence grew gradually. So why don't more people follow up this idea that the evidence grew gradually and we gradually knew better? <clears throat> I mean, there could still be a point, for example, you could say, well, we had ever more evidence, and then at some point it hit the threshold where emissions became wrongful. But, but still, I think it, it, it's a question that not enough people have asked within the prominence of ignorance. Okay. Can I ask one? 
Yes, yes, we have time for one or even two more. It just relates to this, and um, yeah, I like the presentation and the others very much. Um, but I noticed at one point when you talked about the ignorance, it's whether people could know, yeah. and that's how dominant phrase as well. Uh, and it's easy to slip into that way of putting it, but I would encourage you to think about it another way of framing it, which is when is it reasonable to expect people to know? So it's possible that someone could have known because they could have gone to the library in 1897 and read Svante Arrhenius. Yeah. It's totally unreasonable to uh, expect them. And, um, so it's not whether it's possible, it's, it's whether yeah. you know, it's fair enough. And then there's a point which I remember Ed Page uh, making to me, which is what it's reasonable for someone to know depends hugely on who they are. So if they are a uh, civil servant in the Ministry for the Environment, then we should expect their date to be a lot earlier. It's their job. If it's a, uh, a consumer, um, you know, an ordinary consumer in the 1990s, then I think it would just vary. So that who could be reasonably expected to know makes a difference. Okay, cool. Thanks. Sir. More complexity is there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right, then. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Daryl. No, I'm just getting ready to clap. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for it then, everybody. <laughs>